Hello and welcome to this month's market update. I was out for the month of August while traveling across this beautiful country on a road trip. Uh, I'll be sharing some of my adventures on walking in LA. Given this past month's events, it is with sadness that we all reflect on 9-11 for those lost in this tragedy and a terrible resolution to Afghanistan. We continue to pray for all Americans left behind, our allies, and the Afghan people. On this note, the markets have maintained much of their steam throughout the summer. There were some slowdowns in sales, but single-family inventory still remained at record lows while demand remains very high. There have been some hiccups in the jobs numbers over the past few weeks, yet the economy still shows strength despite slipping in consumer sentiment. Federal policy is still adding strain, creating headwinds in multiple markets, while excessive federal spending threatens even more inflation. In this episode, we're going to take a closer look at whether or not we are actually having a housing bubble. And if you have not watched the TNT episode on inflation, you can click the link above. I highly recommend it. I will be posting an inflation update video shortly. In addition, if you would like to jump ahead in this video, I have posted the links below on YouTube and the time numbers on my blog. Okay, let's jump into some of the numbers here real quick. Uh, we're going to just start off with the economy and we're going to take a quick look at the GDP imports exports. What we're really looking at here, and this is from the uh, Euro, US Bureau of Economic Analysis, is just has GDP recovered? Yes, GDP has recovered. We are producing at more than what we were uh, prior to the pandemic. We are absolutely importing more than we did prior to the pandemic. And we are exporting substantially less than we were prior to the pandemic. Uh, but the 10-year bond market seems to be holding right now. We'll see what happens as uh, if there is any kind of positive or negative news in the economy, it affects the 10-year bond market, which reflects on how much we typically pay on our 30-year uh, mortgage rates, which I'll show in a second. All right, unemployment. Well, unemployment rate nationally still sits at 5.2%. Uh, there are various factors that go into it. Most people don't realize that it's actually a survey and how they figure out what the actual rate is, a survey. Um, some people may have left the labor force. We have seen a lot of uh, retirements and whatnot. There is still a large uh, number of people out there who uh, could rejoin the workforce, which we'll see in a second, and have not yet. As we look at the state unemployment rates, this is uh, July 2021. This is from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics state-by-state -state unemployment rates. And as you can see, all the blue states are pretty blue they've got pretty high unemployment, while most of the other states have recovered. Let's look at that in comparison to uh, some of the other uh, time periods. We're going to jump back to 2016, November 2016. We can see, uh, you know, employment uh, was, was doing all right then. It wasn't doing great. It was doing all right. And when you compare that to November of 2019, prior to the pandemic, unemployment rates were substantially low across this nation. And uh, that is reflected in this map. Everyone was doing good. The Los Angeles unemployment rate is at 10.2%. That has not been adjusted yet. Um, that's at, uh, there's various reasons why LA is still having trouble getting back. And a lot of it, I think everybody would kind of agree, is due to the fact that we've just been shut down and nobody really wants to get off the unemployment benefits. So uh, with that ending this month, we will see what happens. We'll see if people get back to work or if we're threatened with another shutdown and more problems that we need to address. So it is what it is. Okay, interest rates. Uh, the 30-year fixed rate mortgage from Freddie Mac is still sitting fairly low for a conforming loan. That is $420,000 or less. We actually with more of a jumbo conforming loan, but that rate is sitting at 2.77%, while a jumbo conforming would be slightly higher. Um, those are base rates where it's at. We have seen a little hiccup and a tick up in mortgage rates over the past uh, you know, few weeks, and goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down, goes back to the bond market, which we just discussed just a few minutes ago. 
uh, the mortgage rate projections are that we are going to see some higher mortgage rates across the board. And this is everyone's kind of projections for going into the second quarter of 2022. And that we're going to see a general average consensus that we're going to go into the 3.58% uh, range, which is still relatively low historically, and that's substantially lower than 2006-2007. Uh, I don't remember it getting this low. Actually, I think it got to 3.375. So that was probably the closest it got, or 3.25. But um, overall, we are going to see mortgage rates rise, as we can see on this chart. And it's just a gradual increase over time as we start to normalize our, um, our financial fiscal policy. We hope. Okay, appreciation in the housing market. Let's talk about this. The year-over-year -year price appreciation percentages are accelerating, and as we can see, the May year-over-year -year is at 15.4% appreciation. That's pretty huge. So many people would look at this and go, well, that's, that's insane. And yeah, I mean, for single-family houses, that's a pretty good, healthy growth rate. However, the media is back at its usual antics, and these guys are constantly trying to find some way to create and cause strain in everybody's lives. This time it has to do with home sales dropping. Well, yes, home sales did slightly drop, but that doesn't mean it's the end of the world and we're all driving off of a cliff, which these guys would more or less like to insinuate. Which brings the question, what news source are you watching really? But when we look at the actual traffic numbers that is registered from the National Association of Realtors, uh, we can see that traffic in April was very strong across this country, and then it started easing up a little bit in May. And in June, it's still very strong. I mean, we have some states that have heavier traffic than others, but they're still strong to very strong buyer traffic going on. So does this signal the end of a housing boom? No. And as we look at it up close, we can see which states have strong um, demand and which ones don't. And it's just measured by the number of people who are going through homes and looking at properties and scheduling appointments. That's really what it's based on. And as we look at this, this is the Showing Time Index, which is uh, another company that is out there that we use to schedule appointments from time to time. Um, you can see that yeah, we, we did see a little bit of fall off in April, May, and June, which is the same numbers and everything is based on nationally, um, but we're still above average. So, you know, why are we worried about this? Well, I don't think we should be just yet. I think the uh, activity is just fine and it will continue and persist as people continue to demand and want more single family housing. And this is a, showing the appreciation year over year the Federal Housing Finance Agency house price index at 18%, CoreLogic Home Price Insights report is at 15.4%, and the Case Shiller is up 16.6%. So this kind of just continues to reflect on the fact that appreciation and traffic in looking for homes is still very strong. Forget CNN. Now. Given that sales activities were coming down, we may be sensing some turn in the market. We are seeing less prevalence of multiple offers. It is still a seller's market, no doubt. Still a seller's market, but people need to be very cautious on how they price their home to attract buyers, knowing that all these sales activities are declining somewhat. Meaning, there's still multiple offers. We're still seeing it, especially in Los Angeles and it's still happening on a fairly, fairly prevalent scale. Now, are some homes not selling as fast? Yes, because they were trying to push the overall pricing of their properties, which is why they're sitting. But if you still price your property aggressively, you will generate multiple offers and you will sell. The Always the general rule of thumb here, and I want everybody to understand, is great properties at a great price always sell fast. Period, end of story. If you need to sell your property, call me. We'll get set up, we'll take a look at it, and we'll sell it fairly quickly. Now, when we talk about home inventory, this is really what has been driving the market. And we're gonna get into more of this uh, when we start talking about the housing bubble in a second. But right now, we have had historically low inventory or month's supply of homes available. We basically take 
the amount of homes that are available and divided by the amount of homes sold, and that is your inventory. That's how it's calculated. Uh, you know, a six to seven month uh, inventory is what we consider to be normal, a neutral market. Anything above seven months is considered a buyer's market. Anything below six months is considered a seller's market. Now in Los Angeles, they might those numbers might shift a little bit. Like once you get into four months of supply, it really starts to feel like a buyer's market. And um, but that's just Los Angeles in general and our kind of uniqueness. But on a national scale, that's how they measure it. That's how they gauge it. And that's how they figure out what kind of inventory we're in. So are we in a housing bubble? It seems to be the question that everybody's floating around. I'm waiting for the sky to fall. I'm waiting for all the foreclosures. Yes. So I can do like I did in 2006 and 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010 during the recession. No, it's not happening. But let's get into it. Let's start with uh, just a simple fact of the risky loans because this is typically what causes people to default is if they're putting in too much out there and they are at risk of not being able to pay uh, exactly what it is that they're looking for. So let's go through it. There is a market differences in today's run up in prices compared by to, to 2005, which was fueled by risky loans and lenient underwriting. Today, loans with high risk features are absent and mortgage underwriting is prudent. And this is uh, Dr. Frank Nothaft, Chief Economist of CoreLogic. So what is he talking about? Well, when we look at it, uh, our mortgage originations, we look at the FICO scores, very important in getting a loan. In 2006, uh, scores, originations with scores of lower than 620, that was 376 billion with a B, billion. When you look at 2020, it was 74 billion. And prices rose too, so you have to consider that as well uh, in this thought process that Prices rose and it was still only 74 billion. That is not a lot. And I've talked about this in the past and where mortgage standings are, but this says a lot as far as the FICO scores are concerned. Okay, so again, are we in a housing bubble and with the mortgage debt and affordability? Well, the household debt service ratio for mortgages is a percentage of personal disposable income. Um, as you can see, was substantially higher. And what that means is that it took more of your personal disposable income to afford a home during the housing bubble than it did today. Today it's at 3.45, so it's still substantially lower. Looking back at the bubble years, house prices exceeded house buying power in 2006 nationally. But today, house buying power is nearly twice as high as the median sales price nationally. Many find that hard to believe, but it, housing is actually undervalued in most markets and the gap between the house buying power and the sales price indicates there is room for further growth in the house price in the month to come. This is Mark Fleming, First American. So if we look at the house affordability index 1992 today, we can actually see that, uh, you know, the years when the, there was quite stressed, uh, you know, the, uh, the affordability index was quite high versus now, which is, seems to be sitting quite in the middle. It's still very affordable, but it's not overly affordable. And as prices continue to rise, we are gonna see affordability start to decrease, but we're still not at the uh, lows that, uh, that puts enough pressure to cause a change in the pace or rate of what it, the housing is currently doing. So are we in a housing bubble? No, absolutely not. What we're dealing with is tight supply and demand. The main driver of housing shortfall is that it has been a long-term decline in the construction of single family homes. It's very true. In fact, when we look at it, the average number of annual units completed, uh, we have just not had any kind of consistent construction going on. In fact, after the housing crisis, it completely fell off. Uh, you know, prior to the housing crisis, we had uh, four consecutive years of record-setting number of units completed, uh, meaning they were building like mad and selling them like mad. 
So uh, just a just a different time period, and this is still we're still below the 50-year average of construction of delivery of units. There are other factors, but this is a major one. Foreclosure and forbearance. Are we headed for a bunch of foreclosures? No. When we look at the forbearance, number of forbearance projections that were out there prior to uh, May 2020 when everybody was thinking it was going to be massive, originally they were thinking it was going to be about 30% and it, it just isn't. Uh, and then it you know kind of topped off to be about 8.47%. And we can continue to see the number of mortgages in active forbearance is, is really now under 2 million, which isn't that much. Uh, when you consider across the entire United States, um, that is extremely low. Nothing like what we saw in um, 2007 through 2011. So, as I was mentioning, uh, the exit plan from forbearance has typically been, you know, 44% were paid in full, 38% were worked out a repayment program, and there's still about 17% that are still in trouble. Uh, you know, when that means no loss mitigation plan or, you know, you got repayment plans, short sales, or deed in lieu. Um, all these are uh, pretty current numbers as of July 11th. The likelihood of us having a foreclosure crisis again is about zero. Yeah, Ivy Zellman, Zellman and Associates. Why is he saying that? So, in re retrospect, now as we look at a percentage of uh, properties that are for sale that are distressed, that means foreclosures and short sales, uh, it is less than 1% of all sales less than 1%. So we're still not there. We're still not seeing an increase. When you look at, you know, January 2012, that was 35% of sales. Markedly different. Okay, let's jump into some of the numbers here. We're going to start off with uh, LA County. That includes Long Beach. Uh, single family active listings were at 8,385 for the month of August. That is a 23.2% decline year over year. You can see that it's spiking up a little bit, uh, but it's still much, much lower than it was a year ago. Single family pending sales at 3,122. That is a minus 35% year over year. Right now, it looks like the pending sales are falling and uh, we are not sure what that is. We'll watch it, we'll see. It could be spiked by a rebound very quickly. We've seen rebounds happen all the time. As you can see on this chart, it goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down. Could be seasonal. Don't know. We'll watch it and see. As far as closed sales, closed sales are still really high. So if there's no pendings, they might have just closed them all. But that was 4,477 sales, and that is about a 2.4% year-over-year increase. Uh, it is pulling back slightly, but it's still very high compared to at the top end of the range. Home prices. Single family median sales price for the month of August was $905,000. That is a 15.5% increase year over year. And the average single family price per square foot was at 628. That's a 15.7% increase year over year. The month supply is sitting at about two months. That's still a 33% decline year over year. Uh, but we are seeing inventory slowly creeping up, which means it's just a modest slowdown. Inventory is, once inventory starts building up again, I'm sure people will be starting to strike and buy again. And then this is one of my favorite charts. This uh, basically puts all the information on one chart so you can see how inventory and closed sales, uh, active sales, pay, play a part in the average price per square foot. On the bottom line, you can see the, the blue line is for sale, the gray line is closed, and you can see the number of homes that are for sale has declined over time while the uh, number of sales has stayed pretty consistent and regular and the average price per square foot has spiked up dramatically due to tight supply. All right, let's take a look at condo prices. The active listings out there in the condo market is 2,766. That's a 20% decline year over year. We are st starting to see the number of listings creep up a little bit, but we're still low as far as uh, the year over year comparison is concerned. The pending sales is at 692. Uh, it's a 38% decline year over year. You can see that this is pretty marked from the uh, peak of sales that happened uh, earlier in the year. 
um, we are seeing sales fall off in the condo market pretty dramatically. Um, as far as the closed sales, uh, that actually is still pretty high uh, at 1,189. That's a 19 to 20% increase year over year, but it is pulling back some and we'll see what happens to the pricing as we watch this. As far as the median sales price, it pulled back a little bit to $575,000. That's a 8 to 9% uh, increase year over year. And the average price per square foot is sitting at 572. That is a 7% increase year over year. When we look at the month supply, it's sitting at 2.5 months. That is minus 40% year over year. That means we took a major hit in the amount of inventory that we have, but it is starting to slowly creep up. Taking a look at leases and rentals. This is a little experiment I started with back at the beginning of uh, COVID. Uh, in which we were using apartments.com as our kind of baseline and we're just taking a look at the number of listings that they have available each month. Uh, right now, their current number of listings is 25,510. Uh, last month, it was 30,574. So we are seeing a decline. And as we look at the chart on the right, just about everything is getting filled up or it's being sold off or it is being uh, used there is still a considerable amount of units out there my hunch is is with ucla and usc coming back and some of the colleges coming back uh, there was some absorption there we'll see what happens in the coming months as to whether or not it's going to stay fully absorbed and or it's going to level off at this twenty-five thousand level and just continue forward we do have a lot of apartment inventory coming online from construction so we will see that as well and uh, over time you know it may balance itself out so we may sit at this number for a minute we'll follow it we'll watch it um, obviously uh, some landlords uh, are holding back um, for some of my apartment clients that we're looking at right now we're finding multiple buildings that are 50 to 75 percent vacant and they're just not filling them and they have not been filling them uh, during COVID just because they did not want to deal with the moratorium and the hassle. And, uh, and now they're just putting them on the open market for sale. So we'll see. Uh, it's interesting times to be sure. That is this month's monthly market update. If you have anything that you want me to answer or take a look at, any questions or areas, if you want me to take a look at the pricing of your home, your condo, your apartment building, your retail space, or even a hotel. I can manage it all. Do uh, reach out and I look forward to all your questions and comments below. Have a wonderful month.